morning. We thank you, God, that you left us with it. We thank you, Lord, that we have someone to teach us today. We pray, God, that you would uh, bring out the verses to us, Lord. I pray that you help them to fall on good ground. You help us to retain the knowledge, Lord, and grow by it. And God, I just pray for your help today, Lord, that you would meet with us, that you bless the teaching and the preaching of your word. And God, we do need your help and your presence. And we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll pick up in Judges chapter 3. And uh, that's when we, uh, I think we were last time, I believe we did the... Uh, beginning of uh, Judges. We went through it. We talked a little bit about the time period. Uh, wild times, uh, just like today, amen? Wild times playing out. If you're watching, it's playing out in Canada. Huh? It's going wild up there. Uh, they're having the time of it up there. And uh, the Muslims and the Christians have come together to let the queers know they can't have the kids. Amen. You know? And so they're out there and they're standing up and they're doing the best that they can, uh, but it's a wild scene to play out. And uh, to see that up in Canada like that, and to watch the uh, Muslims and the Christians all come together and unite and realize there's an attack. And it's it, the attack is to get the weakest among them, and it's the little children. And the little children and, and the school system and the tie-in and the way that that's been and, and how it, it, it's set up, it, they're, in, they're in trouble. And uh, morally, there it's so bad. Just think that uh, you know you've got these people literally uh, assaulting Christians and Muslims that simply say we don't want that, and then the violence comes. So it's violent time, amen. Yeah. So much for the peace, love, and togetherness, and and the Frisco fairies of the '60s and '70s over there uh, having the gay lovings and stuff. Because the truth is uh, that lifestyle is violent. It produces violence, oh, yeah. and uh, it'll never do anything different. Yeah. Uh, when the sodomite is in the land, there's violence in the land. When the sodomite is in the land, corruption is in the land. When the sodomite is in the land and he begins to rule, he likes to take the moral compass of that area and tweak it. And tweak it to become sensual and sexual and uh, lascivious and all the rest of those nice big words to describe if I use the real vernacular, you'd be able to say amen much quicker. But we recognize that here we are, and, and uh, we're born again. We're blood-bought. We recognize God has allowed us to be here in 2023. Our eyes have opened up. We see where we are. We understand. When I get a commercial on there, and it starts off, and it's somebody going, we have found the day out. Yes, yeah, this and that beautiful tone and the, the words and the way she's doing it. It's just wonderful. And what she's talking about is this AI they I don't know why she's talking about, but she's letting everybody know it's the AI that is running and getting things set up and, and doing things and, and it's always been and, and I'm sitting there going, Well, this is just a commercial of propaganda. It's propaganda is all it is. And uh, soon you're going to be told that a machine will know what's better for you and I. Yeah. Amen. These are the days that we're coming to. Why? Because those are the days that were. God wiped it out last time for the same business. Right. Just yeah. because we can't figure out their technology doesn't mean it didn't happen. Right. Nothing better than watching a lunkhead from Harvard try to talk about things that really matter. Amen. Yeah. I mean, they will literally argue about things that there is there is no argument about anymore. Well, I want to argue about whether Jesus really was a historical figure or not. You know, and really, really stand there and want to argue it and say, because they've not seen it and all the rest of that stuff. And then you bring it back over to George Washington and they say, yeah, but there was statues of George Washington. <laughs> yeah. How about that, folks? Can I get a clap? Oh, he's bright. <laughs> Idiots. Yeah. Lockheads, dinks, doofuses. Amen. <laughs> Amen. The little fella gets it, right? But here we are. We look at Judges, right? And the book of Judges is all about God having to raise up men or women. There's not a man around, Deborah. Amen. Raise up a man that's willing to put down those that are against God. But the problem is God left him there. That's the rub. Look, 
Judges 3, verse 1. These are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel. He leaves them there. What do you leave in your life? What do you leave in my life to prove me? Never going anywhere. Going to be there forever. I can tell you that much, bud. What was there when I was nine is still there today, chasing me. Maybe you'll be different. But the bottom line is those things are left there to prove us, to see what we're willing and what we're made of. Now watch this. It says, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Now, this group of people that's going to be listed here are those that are ancient groups, and we'll look into them for just a moment and, and, and see if you think about them. But look at it. It says, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them to war at the least such as before no, knew nothing thereof. So want to take men that knew nothing about something and teach them, right? Now, God leaves things in your life, and he left things in your father's life, and his father's father's life, and they call that generational curses. That's what your psychologists and psychiatrists and, and local dingbat will tell you, right? But really what it is, is it's just what your lot in life was. Uh, it's what your lot is. That's what God calls it, your lot in life. Amen. And uh, he here, he tells them, uh, he names the five lords. We looked at that last time. But notice as we go down in verse 5, it says, And the children of Israel dwelt among who? Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. That's the forbidden seed. We've talked about this, amen? That's that forbidden seed that uh, uh, God had told them to kill uh, those uh, groups and to get rid of them. We know the Canaanites, those are those cannibals. The Amorites, that's a strange group you know they have no uh archaeology or recording of where they began or how they began or who their father is or who the father of the nation is it's just this group of people that pop up in genesis and uh you know what the name amorite means high or tall ones now notice it goes on and it's the perizzites and those are the genesis 13 7 crowd that they were told to stay away from they, too, seem to have come from that seed, that seed of the Nephilim. And uh, notice we go on, and uh, the Hivites, what about them? Genesis 10, 7. Where did they dwell, by the way? They dwelt under Mount Hermon. Anybody who's into anything knows Mount Hermon is supposedly a stargate. It's supposedly where the fallen angels came down. It's where Enoch says they came down. It's where they dwelt, and then it's where they took and mated with humans and spread out from there. That too far fetched for you? Well, uh, notice uh, who else we got there? The uh, Jebusites. We find those are those ones that what lived in Jerusalem originally. We talked about King what Adonai Zedek, right? We know what Adonai means, right? So here's a king back then, and he's over Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is said to be filled with what giants. You remember what they went in the land? Remember what happened? They looked, they said, they're giants in the land, can't, can't take it. God said, okay, good for you. Now go wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Imagine that unbelief, 40 years. 40 years till you all die off. 40 years they wandered around. And what would have took days? Amen. Anyway, we look and we see that these ones are left. Now look what happened. And they took their daughters to be their wives, gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. Why'd you leave them, God? Why didn't you just take them out? Why didn't you do what we didn't do if you're so full of love and compassion and mercy and oh, all that stuff they told us? Because they gave you one side of God. They did not give you the true history or revelation of God from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. What we find in the book of Genesis through Revelation is God dealing with man, and he deals with man in such a way where he allow, allows man to make decisions for himself. Soon you're going to be told, you'd be better off being a robot. You won't be depressed. You won't have sadness. You won't have sleepless nights. Just, you know, let us mess with you a little bit. We'll get in there. We'll tweak you up a little bit. They tried drugs. That didn't work. Everybody knows what happens when you do that. It ain't going to work. But they'll come up with something. 
going to be it's going to be an artificial intelligent thing that they're going to add into you and want you to take and accept willingly to take and give you that happiness that you seek that they've told you what it is man has said what happiness is happiness is nike sneakers for me it was converse just strictly white canvas with a little star on it you know if you was poor you make your own star on it amen yeah yeah see they got up big though didn't it now they started killing people for sneakers nobody killed anybody for charlie's surplus sneakers let me tell you they might have wanted them huh all of a sudden sneakers became this why because somebody must have bought a sneaker company Next thing you know, sneakers, sneakers. Anyway, but uh, you notice what happens there? They intermarry, and then they begin to what? Serve their gods. You know what I've always stopped, and it just gets in your mind, doesn't it? Where did they come up with the worship? Right? We're taught God made the earth and nothing's there, and He plants a garden, and then one day Adam and Eve get kicked out, and the next thing you know, they're worshiping animals. Right. It was already doing it. It was a fallen world already. The pre-Adamic earth was still out there. The remnants, all of it still out there. That's what man came in. Man didn't walk out from a garden into another garden. He walked into a place that hated humanity and what God had made. Why? Because it was in the image of something they hate. God, their creator. Their God is the God of this world. And the God of this world gives you pleasure now and doesn't tell you about later on. That's what he does. So these ones here in the book of Judges, we begin and we see right off the bat, God left them there. He leaves them there for a purpose. And guess what? They fall right into it. Irritates me because I fall right into it. I'm falling into it right when I leave here. I fall into it at church. Someone come in and I can fall right into it. I've broken it. I can fall right into my thing. Can you fall right into yours? Yeah. Probably so. So I recognize it. I recognize God's left these things. God will continue to bring those things. Probably when I'm an old man and they're coming to euthanize me. Huh? Right? They come to give you those happy meds before you go to the other side. Right? Huh? I'll probably be fighting or something, arguing. I don't anyway. Asking them uh, something about it. But anyway, we look and we see they begin to serve their gods. Ready? So now look it. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forget the Lord. They forgot them. So what's it all about then? What's it gonna take for you to forget God? What's it take for America to forget God? World War One after World War One, ba -da -ba -ba. World War Two, ba -ba -ba -ba. right? Then came 1960s. It was like somebody hit a reset button, and everything got tweaked. And the soldiers came home, and now we're enemy of the state, enemy of the people, inhumane. What they didn't know is in World War Two, they killed children and they killed. Men and they killed women because it's called war. Right. These young fellas are coming home now, and you know what's happening? They come home and they come home to America and they get here and they look at women and they look at children and they no longer see enemy and they wonder what, what, what made them an enemy in Iraq. And see, they begin to think of the toll and what they did. And the lives, and next thing you know, what they're doing is wanting to commit suicide. Yeah. Next thing you know, you know what they're doing, they're shooting up college. Next thing you know, what they're doing, something to alleviate the memory and the pain of what they did. Oh, yeah. It's a rough road. These ones here, you find that the, the Lord allows those things to be in, in, in the life of this nation, and this nation has those things put in front of them. When World War II came after World War II, you know what happened? Those fellas came home and were heroes, and, and they, they, were, they were looked at as great Americans, and the Italian Americans that were nothing but dago garbage wops were now looked at as the great Americans. Why? Because they gave their lives for this country. What did the nation do for the deaths of all those men? They're turning it over to the Sodomites. 
So what will happen then, according to the Bible, if we forget God? Who'll come? Some judgment, right? Yes. It's going to come, oh, yeah. right? Why? Because what we've done is we've said no to God. God said, man and a woman, children, family. He said, they've said we redesigned it. We make it into a law. It is what it is. Stamp the approval. Away we go. Right? Abortion, stamp of approval. These are all those things that when a nation does it, if God doesn't judge them, the Bible isn't true. Yeah. You go, what do you need? Repentance. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't seem like it comes. It seems like the only way a man will repent is when the heavy hand of an oppressor comes upon him. And I mean a heavy hand of an oppressor oh, yeah. that will make them turn to God. This is what happens for the children of Israel. I don't know that I can go through the whole book of Judges. I just feel like it'll be just too re repetitive. I feel like we can watch this thing. Ready? Here we go. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. What did he do? He sold them. He sold them into the hand of Chushan Rish Hatham, king of Mesopotamia. Ready? And when the children of Israel cried, verse 9, unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. So what does it take for God to take and come to a nation? The children of that nation must cry out to God. Yeah. And look to God. And look for God to send touch. Look, you, I got thinking about this thing. Because, uh, you know, old DJT's coming around for round two or whatever's going to happen. What would have happened if that old fella there... Uh, 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 he would have stayed in office. You realize how many people would have lined up and took the jab? Yeah. Instead of all the lefties doing it, it would have been the righties doing it. I wonder if they just took it and said, which fools will we get to do what we want? Should we take and throw lefty in there again or throw righty back in there again and get him again? Because he was doing it warp speed. I didn't forget any of that stuff. I didn't forget what he stood for during that time period and how he said warp speed will get all the babies jabbed. We'll jab, jab, jab a doo, right? He the guy gonna get it done. Warp speed. We forgot about that. What if that took place? Was that God giving us a reprieve? Bringing in Joe Biden? Huh? So everybody could see what a crook is. You didn't know what a crook is? I knew what a crook was. You should have asked me. I could have told you. See, all you got to do is look at a guy's tax records, and you can tell whether he's a crook or not. That's how they get Italians all the time. Oh, yeah. If you live above your means, it's easy to catch it. So if you're making $140,000 a year tops, and you're 85 years old and have millions and millions of dollars, unless you are a, a genuine Wall Street whiz, something's happened there that is at least worth, worth taking a look at. We're not talking about a brainiac here. We're talking about a street-level thug. He becomes all things for all people. He's a Puerto Rican when he's amongst Puerto Ricans, and he's a uh, Ethiopian when he's among. I've watched him say it. I was brought up in Cranston around the, the Ethiopian crowd. It's like what Ethiopian crowd you grew up in in, in in Pennsylvania, Joe? You're just lying, and you think because you, it sounds good, they're all gonna believe you. So what do you got? A nation that has a leader that everyone knows is a lying crook. But well, life just keeps going on because there ain't thing one we can do about it. Yeah. Isn't there something though? Yeah. Yeah, we can't we'll, we'll go march on there all we want. What if we all marched instead to prayer? Amen. Everybody. I mean, Catholics, Protestants, everybody just began to cry out to the Creator for help. Yeah. Amen. Because you ain't getting it in Washington. They showed you what they'll do. Go ahead and march on it again and see if they're not ready next time. Because uh, they've set the they've set the stage for the next time people march. It'll be like they did in the 1930s, in the 1920s and 30s, when them boys from World War One decided it was time to get their little checks. They came home from World War I and were given this great certificate of one day being able to redeem it for their service to the Lord. So they all marched uh, to the to the wartime, and they all marched down to Washington, and they said, we're going to stay here. We're going to stay here until they do something. So they began to put up shanties everywhere. 
So you know what they brought, did? They brought in Patton, and they brought in uh, Ike, and uh, they both stood there with their arms back, walking back and forth, looking at the thing, and decided it's time. And they rolled in the tanks, and they began to slaughter. Yeah. They needed America. How come they didn't teach us that in school? Right. Why did I have to learn that as an old man? I wonder how I would have felt as a younger man when I had a little bit of oomph left in me. How I would have felt about all these lies that are coming out. Imagine that. World War I, all they did. And know what they were called? That's the hobos and bums we were told about. That go from town to town with nothing. Because they had nothing. Because they gave everything to fight for the country. So they put a stick and a thing and we got cartoons about them and told them to laugh about them. They were real people. Tens of thousands of men. Forgotten. Yeah. You know who didn't forget? Amen. He got a long memory. Oh, yeah. I'm reckoning he's going way, way back when the time comes. Because when he swats it, it's going to be good. It'll be good. It has to be. Or I'll have to apologize. But notice what happens. They cry. The Lord raises up a deliverer. We talked about him. Off nail. He's Caleb's younger brother. Right? Now notice it says the spirit of the Lord came upon him. He judged Israel. And he went out to war. So I guess when God calls a man, this is what he does. But not in America. In America, they sit behind desks and they sign policies and they do things like this and they're trying to write history and they're trying to change it. They're doing all that stuff. It has very little to do with you and I. It's best for you and I to live our life, take our eyes off of that stuff and recognize that we live and we have a higher calling. Yeah, amen. Notice it goes on here and it, it tells you that in verse 12, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. The Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. Who were they? Ammon and Moab. Lots incestuous kids. See what I mean? See how you never get rid of it? You don't get rid of it. It's here. Where is it today? It's here still. Oh, yeah. It's here somewhere because it's in the seed. You can't get rid of the seed. But here out of nowhere to Moab. Gee, Lot, thanks a lot. Don't forget who he is. Righteous Lot. Huh? He was vexed because he went into that city. But he was a righteous man. Interesting, isn't it? He's a righteous man sitting in Sodom when the angels show up. He's a righteous man when the angels show up and the men of the city come around the house and want to have their way with those two men. He's righteous Lot. To everything. He's written down in the, in the, in the Hebrews book of faith. Interesting. Notice it says here, it says, once again, it says, verse 13, he gathered unto them the children of Ammon and Amalek. And they went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. The children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. You notice something? The first time was eight. <laughs> the first time they served, it's eight. The next time it's going to be 18. What you're going to find is they had rest for 40 years with Othniel. And then you're going to find they had 80 years rest after that one. You know what I see? A merciful God. Yeah, amen. I see a merciful God that when it takes eight years for him to cry out, he go ahead, he gives them 40 years. It takes 18 years before they begin to really cry out. The devil's good. Yeah. He don't let you know you're a slave right away. <clears throat> took me 60 years. He lets you think you're free. Notice 15 said, children of Israel cry. Huh? The Lord raised up the deliverer. Ehud, son of Gerah, a Benjamin, a man left-handed. That ought to stop you dead in your tracks. Why God put that in there? Oh, yeah. You ought to go look up left-handed in the Bible. Don't go look in other books. Look in the Bible about it. Left-handed one. Now notice, it goes on, it says, and uh, uh, you know what happens here? Watch, Ehud made him a dagger. Now, we spent time on this, I remember now, and uh, we talked about how that could be the word of God, amen? 
Because the word of God is what? A double-edged sword. Oh, yeah. So in type, this is the word. Amen. Notice it says, he who had made him a dagger, had two edges, scuba length, and a girt under his raiment about his right eye. He went into Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon's a fat guy. Notice what happens. He goes in there, and what does he do? Verse 21, and Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And Haft also went in after the blade. In other words, it swallowed it up. And the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Reminds me of a gal that was in a, a guy that was in a hotel room. Guy was in a hotel room, and all of a sudden, he's dead. Just dead. They don't know why he's dead. They figured he must have had a heart attack or something. The only blood that he had, the blood had come out. He had blood down here or something. So people didn't like the fact that they were saying the cat just died. Something had to happen. So the cop said nothing happened. So they hired a guy. Guy walks into the room. He stands there. And they found the guy there. The guy was right there sitting up smoking a cigarette. And the next thing you know, he's dead. That guy sat there like this, looked like this, walked over behind the guy, walked over to the wall, went like this, cleared away some stuff. He was two-faced, a little paint over it, cleared it away, and bullet hole right there. What had happened was the bullet had came in, went into the guy, hit something, traveled down. They weren't looking for a bullet. This guy here gets stabbed in the belly, and this guy going to walk out, and nobody's going to know what happened because it swallowed it right up. Well, how about that thing? Nobody would have ever known what happened to that fellow. Businessman sitting in a hotel died. Cop said, he just died. What was he doing when he died? Sitting on the bed. What was he doing sitting on the bed? Sitting on the bed like he did every night before he went to bed and smoked a cigarette because he didn't want to lay down. He's sitting there with a cigarette next thing you know he's dead. You go, how did all that come out? Well, of course, they went to the people who were in the next room that day and began to sweat him out. Next thing you know, a kid was fooling around with a gun. He shot the gun. Seen what happened, heard what happened, took and blocked the hole, checked out, hoped for the best. Didn't work out so good. Be sure your sin will find you out. Oh, yeah. Notice here, it goes on, he kills him, amen. And uh, it goes on and tells you all about how they find him and all that business. And we go down there and we come across this other fellow who's going to pop up here for you to take a look at in verse 31. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath. He slew Philistines 600 men with an ox goad. I think I told you last time, 600 could be just a number referring to somebody saying, well, he knocked out 10 guys. We know what that means. It don't mean there were 10 guys there. It meant he knocked out a lot of guys. It meant he fought a lot of guys. So we don't know if that's it or there was a, an actual 600 count. But this individual right here, the only thing he had for weaponry was this ox goad. That's because, of course, we know the Philistines took that away. But you know what? I think what I want to look at for just a moment, and uh, 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 I think it's important. We've seen in Judges chapter 3, verse number 1, the whole purpose of all of this is what? What's the purpose of it? Oh, approval. 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 Your whole life is about that. Kind of prove you what you are. What you made of? What's it going to take for you to corrupt? What's it going to take for you to sell out? What's it going to take for you to give up? all of that stuff? It's what it is. And it's God ordained. It ain't meant to kill you. It's meant to build you. Amen. Know what happens the first time you take and you see something and it ain't yours and you don't take it? And you know you could take that thing and you know nobody would know you took that thing. You know what happens? You begin to mold your character. You begin to go, no, 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 it's wrong, right? First time you get ready to lie after you know what a lie is and you begin to check yourself on that. I remember my dad telling me when I was a young boy, he looked at me, he said, don't ever lie to me. He said, you can tell me the truth. You'll be far better off. I always tell the truth. Cowards have to lie. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. My grandmother used to say, you can hide things from thieves. I can lock things up from thieves. You can put that into a place and you can lock that away and keep that from that thief and keep the thief safe from himself. But Joseph, you can't do anything with the liar. There's something about learning that when you don't lie, what's happening? You've been, you've been proved. Amen. You won't lie. You won't steal. You know how you're going to get from God when you stop robbing God. That's how you get from God. 
He proves you. He gives you to see what you do. And then if you do what's right, God will give you more. If you take and do what's wrong, God's a good God. He's only going to give you what you need to get by because you can't handle any more than that. You notice as we look over here for just a moment in Ephesians chapter 5, I think for you and I, if we're going to put any of it, any of it into action, we better have something to go by. Amen. And this kind of it rocked me this morning. It put me a little bit in check over some things and maybe it'll help you. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, and we know what this is all about. It's basically Paul giving you the way you ought to live your life. He called it preaching, I guess, right? He says, be therefore followers of God as dear children. He tells you to walk in love as Christ also has loved us. He says in verse 3, fornication, uncleanness, covetous, let it covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become its saints. He tells you about filthiness, that's sexual filthiness. She's not cleaning your room, and you ought to clean your room, but they're not talking about that. Notice it goes on, and it says, no foolish talk, jesting, which are not convenient. He goes on and tells you what you ought to do, give thanks. He says that you shouldn't have any business hanging around with whoremongers. What's a whoremonger? That's a man or a woman that chase after the opposite sex. Yeah. If you get around somebody that all they want to talk to you about is going and chasing women, you better watch yourself. Watch that guy. Be careful around that guy. Oh, yeah. It ain't about that. It's supposed to be about finding a mate that you can be with for the rest of your life. That's Not right. about running around being a whore mom right. or running around just giving yourself over to whatever it is. We're just not supposed to do it. It's wrong. Amen. Amen. I'll put you out. Amen. Amen. We'll put you out. Nor unclean person, nor covetous. Watch. Who's an idolater? Now, you do what you want with this, but look what it says. That one that's like that has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. You got those things in your life and you think you're going to go into the millennial reign of Christ and get rewards? Right. I didn't say you won't. You go into eternity. I'm talking about the reward hour. That extra thousand years. The millennial reign of Christ. Amen. That's the bonus. Yeah. But you don't get to if you keep these things. Now watch. I'm going to show you something here. He goes on. He says this in verse number five. He says, he said, no, in the covetous man ready, in verse number six, let no man deceive you with vain words. Why? Because they're going to come along and tell you it don't matter. Those are vain words. You can shack up. You ought to try her first. Take her for a trial run. Mm. Well, good. I hope 100 other guys took her for a trial run before you did. Mm. And I hope they hadn't changed the oil. <laughs> for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of what? Disobedience. So I guess children that are disobedient do these things, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Huh? What do you think? We think the church don't have this problem? Right. We think there ain't three rows missing right now with people who should be in it, but because of sin, they're not here. Right. Nothing right. less. They can tell you it's character. They can tell you it's somebody who's too hard, too easy, too soft. Whatever. It's sin. Yeah. It's yeah. sin. Yeah. Sin's hard to deal with. Yeah. Ready? But watch, we'll get where we're going. He goes on, he says, verse 7, Be ye not therefore partakers with them. What happens if I let the fornicator? What happens if I let the whoremonger? What happens if I let that unclean spirit come in here, some queer come in here, start sitting up close to our young fellas, wanting to get close to them? Every time I see a man come around, I think about that. I won't lie, that's just how I am. When I see some older guy come around, that's what I think. I watch him. I look. It ain't always true, but I'm going to look and see. Why? Because I care. Amen. I care. I genuinely care. Because they come in with vain words. And watch. For because of these things comes the wrath of God. What happened in the book of Judges? The wrath of God fell. Oh, yeah. How did he have it fall? Different ways, but he had it fall. The oppressors. Amen. Oh, yeah. He hasn't come. The Moabites. He hasn't come. He has these ones come, and they're sent there, and they're ordained, and they're there to test you. Every day! For me, you know what it is. Come to test me to get me out of spirit. Yep. Get me in the flesh. Oh, yeah. I like being in the flesh sometimes. People do what I want when I'm in the flesh. They actually, I think. <laughs> they might even be a little frightened sometimes. But when I go with the Jesus loves everybody thing, it just don't work. It don't work in business. It don't work in disciplining children. It don't work in disciplining a church. It just don't work. Why? Because that ain't the way the Bible shows it. Right. 
Now watch what happens here. You'll see. He says, he says this. He says, don't be partakers with him. Ready? Then he goes on and he says, for the fruit of the fruit of the spirit is what? In all goodness and righteousness and truth. Ready? Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Do you know, I think we live our whole lives just trying to figure out, Lord, like this or not? Lord, do you mind me doing this? Lord, Lord, you okay with this? Amen. Yeah. Prove. Yeah. How are you going to find out? Right. right. Only one way to find out. You got to try. God, you okay with this? Amen. Wait a minute, boy. Took you away from church. Well, Lord, you don't understand. Oh, yes, He does. You will try. You will try and found one. He's laughing away at me. He tried and found lacking in that area. So you go, well, good God, give me a reprieve. No, he won't. He'll send more. Got a bad temper? Have no patience? Guess what God does? He sends you things to give you patience. Yeah, that's right. We're looking at one. <laughs> Amen, Mama? Right? We're looking at one. Sent for each one of us to learn patience. Mercy. It's someone got to be in there, right? Oh, yeah. All those things. What are they there for? Well, not all of them are like that because we just whack them all out. Amen? But I lost my train of thought when I see that smiling little boy when I talk about it. But you notice here it says proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Well, I thought about that proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Uh, we all know this. Romans chapter 12. Look at Romans chapter number 12 for just a minute. And we know this. We quote it all the time. I quote this so much that uh, I think people think I just write this one. But this is one of the first verses I ever memorized. And uh, it stayed with me. And I, I try to live this verse. But notice, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So it's for me and you. He says, by the mercies of God, and boy, I need them. You know, I wake up and let God know I need your mercy today. I do. I need your mercy today. And I need your grace. I need that more than I need help with my aching body. I need that more than any. I need that on me to navigate. Amen. But watch. It says, he says, uh, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living and sacrifice. Ready? Holy. Ready? Acceptable unto God. Right? Which is your reasonable service. So what do we do? Even in our ministry, Pastor. It's what's acceptable. Just the other day, Pastor and I were driving and we were talking about a great need. And all of a sudden, the old fellow over there, 30 years old, the old guy, right? He said, well, just because there's a need doesn't mandate a car. And I thought, <laughs> boy, I think he's heard that somewhere before. But that's the truth because there's needs everywhere. We drive into Worcester and we see the homeless. We see those that are messed up and we want to do things. We see those that are having other struggles and all kinds of things. But you see... Just because it's not necessary. But notice what it says there. Notice what it says. Acceptable. Acceptable unto God. And it's your reasonable service. And now notice again. Be not conformed to this world. So I notice there that if I'm going to end up getting it accepted, it isn't going to be by me conforming to the world's image of what a man ought to be. I tried their pants on. They don't fit. You do what you want with that. But I've tried their pants on. They don't fit. Now, I get it. I'm getting older. But that, uh, 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 uh. you're designing them pants different. You're making the cut different. And you're doing it with a purpose because you want our men to look effeminate. And God forbid they got a little room in their britches and wear a belt around their pants and hold them up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I could snap them. <laughs> but notice what it said. Conform this world. He said, you could get transformed, ready? That mind gets transformed and renewed that you might prove. How do you prove something? You're a wrestler, right? You well, don't, you're a wrestler. Don't tell me you're not. I can look at you and tell you. Like, oh, my, your arms are all around <laughs> <laughs> right? But what are you going to do? If me and you are wrestling and you're teaching and we're training, you need to prove my arm. You can't just hold it weak. Oh, no, that's no 
Right? No, you're going to go like that. You see how much I'm going to go like that, right? Yeah. And I'm going to go, oh, I can take that much, right? Now we know it's been proved. Yeah. See? So now he knows. So if he wants to, he can go whap and break my arm. Yeah. And that's what they do. You ever watch those fellas, Hoist Gracie and them guys, when a young cop, these guys would come into the dojo, think they knew stuff? They just break their arm. Yeah. God, feed me your arm, and then I will take it and I will snap it. How about your leg? Feed me your leg. What's he done? He's proven to himself how much tension it takes to snap a bone. You're being proved. Oh, yeah. You're being proved. And then you're trying to see what God is saying yes to. Amen. God keeps shutting you down. How many times is he going to shut you down before you go, well, I've proven God on this one. Yeah. He don't want this in my life. Right. I tell the story way back when in the 80s, getting out of the joint, having a little weed in my watch pocket, and stupid me getting it, going fishing. I'm not doing nothing wrong. And Lord, you don't want me smoking marijuana anymore. Even though it's illegal, I'm not going to jail for it back to prison, right? You don't, want, you don't want me smoking anymore because it makes me feel so close to you. You know how I get with you, Lord? I listen to Jim Croce when I'm, when I'm listening to him. smoking pot, Lord. Huh? You show me, Lord. It's no story. I was fishing, Wallen Lake, 6.30 in the morning. I had my holes all set. My buddy had his, and everybody was everywhere. And I know now maybe the cop pulled up and ran my plate. Now I get it, but I didn't then. He rides in, state cop, not a forest guy, state cop, black cop. Toomey was his name. I'll never forget him. He drives in, state cop. He pulls up, cuts out of the car, walks out. Don't look at anyone else. He points at me. Maybe he ran my name. Maybe he's seen a picture. Of me. I don't know. But he calls me out, and I come walking over. What can I do for you, officer? What's your name? See, it wasn't like nowadays where you go, you got any probable cause? <laughs> yeah. Here's my name, number, everything you want. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. right? Here I am. He says, you got a warrant on you. Warrant on me, yeah. You got a warrant. I just got out of prison. I can't have a warrant on you. You got a warrant on you. Got anything on you? Yep. All right, not watch block. They took it out. He said, you're on paper. You go back to state prison for that. He took that thing and went just like this. Put me in the back seat of the car, drove me to the courthouse. I got out in my fishing gear. I walked into the courthouse, the old courthouse. Walked up there, walked in, went to the clerk's office, and I heard I had a warrant. They said, let's take us a look at it. And I looked, or whatever they did back then. <laughs> right? They looked. And uh, they said, no, you don't have one. So I don't know, maybe maybe there was a mystical warrant there. Maybe this was the Lord intervening. But I know one thing. Old Joey knew one thing. As far as I could tell, God was against it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as far as I could tell, God was against it. I've never gone back on that. I've never said, well, now, you know, things have changed. And it's been 40 years. And it ain't Jim Croce now. It's somebody else. No, no. If God put it on me and prove me something that was between me and him. Amen. Yeah, so amen. I live with that. Now you got things in your life and things that you have come up and things that you're dealing with. Now if you're a new Christian, it's all new. But if you look at your Bible and you see God is a God that seems to be somebody that wants us to know what our breaking point is. Yeah. So that we can be aware of it. Amen. You know it would be foolish for somebody who's a drunkard to go hang around the bar room, even to play in league play, darts, or or, or, or or some other thing. Why? Because he surrounded himself with that thing. Yeah, and I knew my Uncle Jimmy Todd, he had one drink a year yeah. after he, he got sober. One drink a year, every Christmas. He had more than one, too. They had to drive him home every Christmas. <laughs> but oh, Uncle Jim, and uh, he'd, he'd go down, and he, but he stopped drinking after his wife died because he had to care for his kids. Stop yeah. drinking, never drink again. And that was it. But for some reason, Uncle Jim still did go down to the American Legion and some of these other places and hang out. But I'll tell you what, that's few and far between yeah. that can go amongst that thing that is their temptation and not be tempted by it and not be drawn into it and not become accepting of it yeah. or what? To change your view on it. Right. 
Do you know if you just change your view on things, society will be okay with you. If you change your view on the LGBTQT, you change your view on, on, on a lot of things that people will just be okay. And if you just stay quiet and said, well, I'll just, you know, each his own. But it's when you formulate an opinion. And that opinion goes along with the book. The authority lies with the book. Yeah, amen. Now, these nations, they're not people, individual. These are nations answering. God deals with you and I as individuals. Yes. He deals with us as humans, not as a collective group. You and I today have those things that are brought into our life. And I wanted to show you one other thing here, and I'll be done in Ephesians. Where does the Bible? In Ephesians, and I'll, I'll end it right this. Because if you look here in Ephesians, you've seen in Romans what it said and how it talks about that before mind. I think what happens as you get tested, sis, as you grow, what happens is all of a sudden you literally have watched God allow you to go right to the line. And you go, yeah, that's as far as God wants me to go. I'm not allowed. To. Others can. Yeah. Others can. Not say, hey, others can. I'm saying what God has shown me for my life, what he wants. Amen. Yeah. Or look at here what it said in Ephesians 5. He goes on, he said, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, ready, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know what I, I got to say about that? I think sometimes the things we read, the things that we watch, those things, that's unfruitful works. Yeah. That's what that is. And what are we doing? What we're doing is we're kind of just watching it. We're not taking part of it, but it's unfruitful. And it's unfruitful works of darkness. And what we're doing is we're entertaining it. We're watching it. We're not you're just looking at it from afar. But what's happening is we're like Sodom and Gomorrah to Lot. He pitched his tent towards it so he could see it, so he could watch it. You remember what happens to him? Do you know why he ends up having an incestuous relationship with his daughters? Because what takes place is his daughters are under the opinion that there are no men left to procreate with. Now, why is that when they just got to the city of Zoar? Because the men of Zoar didn't procreate. <laughs> they were Frisco fairies. They were sodomites. So what does he do? He says, gals, we got to get up to the mountains. They get up to the mountain. Think about this. The girls get their father so drunk. Think about that stuff. And not one night, two nights in a row. You go pray about that stuff. A lot. But you notice there it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead reprove them. Ready? Because it's a shame to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. I believe that we will not be able to take and get rid of a lot of those things until we literally begin to take and go, you know what? These things are, are even a shame uh, uh, that, that they're doing and they shouldn't even be spoken of. And I need to put those things away. And then looking at myself, listen, unfruitful works and a secret life will kill you. Yeah, that's right. Your secret life will kill you. Oh, yeah. Amen. The secret life will kill you. Now, I know I watch the murder crime programs. I do. First thing they do is go look into the guy's life. How about the fellow that got killed, the businessman down in Georgia? They found his body wrapped up in a carpet. First glance, it's, oh, my goodness. Guy goes away on business, construction guy, gets there. They see him leave his hotel. He goes into a club. He, he eats. He drinks a little bit much. And then he walks out. He's never seen him. Come to find out, he's picked up by a dealer. He's looking for drugs. He goes and finds drugs. He overdoses while he's with them. The guy don't know what to do, wants to kind of use his cards for a few days. So he wraps him up in the carpet, throws him into the trunk for a couple of days till he stink it. And then he takes and he says, gee, this is terrible. And he puts him, I think, behind a church or something. And they're, they're, they're upset about what happened, but this is the life of a drug dealer. They don't know who this cat is. They don't know that in just a few hours, there's going to be all kinds of people looking for him, that he's a businessman. He has wife and children. He's middle-class America. He's just flown to this city because he's there for a big a big meeting. with other. He's got a meeting that next morning with another man. He's dead. Yeah. You know what happened to that fella? His secret life yeah. popped up on him. Oh, yeah. 
Remind me of the two cops that left Oklahoma and went to Florida. And the one cop wakes up after killing, killing his chief. There's no memory of it. Secret life of an alcoholic. Yep. They can operate in a blur. He kills his best friend, Lucky. Loves the family. Everybody loves everybody. And this big love is sitting there like this. And he's saying, you're telling me I killed Lucky? Yeah, you killed him. Secret life of an alcoholic. Yep. So drunk. Most of the time, probably don't know much about what's happened. He's wet. Yep. Nobody stopped him. Well, we warned him. Secret life will kill you. The secret life is that thing that you can't tell anybody about because you've got a little bit of shame about it. That's that thing you ought to get rid of. Oh, yeah. Amen. That thing that you think that you can't live without because it's been a part of you so long is that thing God desperately wants out of your life. Amen. Everybody's got something different. It could be anything you want. I fight with getting angry. I fight with losing my patience. And I fight with uh, suicidal thoughts on others. <laughs> I think that's called murderous, yeah. murderous thoughts. Amen. Yeah. But uh, you, you know, you wrestle with anger and stuff like that, so you get to deal with that a lot, right? Some of those other sins are nighttime sins. You know, when nobody's around, yeah. you gotta be careful of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Young man sitting there, you need to be careful what you put in your body, what you watch in your eyes. Young lady, you need to watch what you put in your eyes. <laughs> you know, a young lady and a young man with your whole life in front of you. Wow. Know what I call that? Opportunity. Oh yeah. Amen. Opportunity to learn from the mistakes of others. And here you see in the book of Judges, whole nation, whole nation that stays corrupted, not once, but through 13 judges. They'll go through this same repetition, folks, of God sending down somebody to rescue them, a type of Christ, to rescue them in their peril. Only to have them to go back to it. Only to have God to send again the oppressor. God was showing them through each judge. I am against these things. Yeah, amen. Simple. He's put things in your life. He wants you to stop them. He'll put things in your way because he loves you. He'll have things pop up. I think of people who have spending problems. It's easy to get caught up in spending problems. What if I told you there was a wife that killed her husband because of spending problems? Wasn't that she didn't? She was a Christian. She was fearful to go to him to say to him, I have spent our money and now I have taken and done this and I've done that and I'm so embarrassed and I'm ashamed. She thought she had no out. You go, well, that's just crazy. You're not her. Right. We're not talking about, we're talking middle class American here, church going person, but her thoughts were, my husband won't forgive me. Why? Because finances are important. She had brought her family into a room. And her husband was about to find out. She hadn't paid the electric bill. They were going to shut the electric off. Her husband was about to find out. She hadn't paid the uh, insurance bills and other bills. And they had all piled up. So as soon as he's whacked out, the first thing they did was say, let's look at the finances of the house. And that poor Christian woman... Instead of sitting with her husband saying, I've messed up, she's sitting with the detective explaining to him her parable. And forthright told him everything. What am I saying here? What's God got in your life proving you? Yeah. If he's telling you to stop, stop. If he's telling you to go, go. Amen? Amen. That's right. Father, we love you. We thank you for all things. We love you, Lord, because you're so good to us. And that your mercy does endure forever. I thank you, Lord, that as I study these things out, I see you as having great amount of mercy on your people. And Lord, I think of our nation today and what we're involved in, and I pray for it, Lord. I pray that you would take and hear our cries today, Lord, as we cry out to you to look down upon us and see that we do stand by the truth and will, Lord, prayerfully till the end. We'll stand by what the book says about things. We love you and bow before you and you only. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> Mm -hmm. My feet.